lecture, feel free to wander up and bid on some of those pieces. Uh, we'll get our talk started here real quick, but I'd like to quickly thank the people who make this um, lecture series possible. Um, Mel and Adam Lewis are underwriting our series this year as title sponsors. They're doing that in honor of Toby. Uh, Toby was a great friend of the ranch for many years, a trustee. She built the Progressive Collection. She was a force of nature in the art world, and we will all miss her. We'll clap for Toby. <laughs> Toby passed away this spring, and she will be dearly missed. Uh, she was a great friend to many. Uh, I want to thank Oolite Arts, our partner in the um, Home Away Artist in Residence program. I think Dennis is here somewhere, hiding. Um, He's waving. Uh, just a really amazing partnership, uh, support of the ranch. They bring in artists from uh, Miami that spend five weeks here and do some really just amazing things, amazing impact on those artists. So thank you to them as well. Um, some individual sponsors, uh, Rona and Jeff Citrin, uh, Eleanor and Domenico De Soleil, Sharon Joe Felson and Reggie and Lee Smith also individually write this series. So I really want to thank them for that special support, Douglas. We are thrilled to have you here, our curator in residence, continuing that tradition of having just really phenomenal speakers on this series throughout the summer, a great mentor to our staff and an advocate for the ranch. So thank you, Douglas, and I will let you give Yinka a formal welcome and lead our conversation today. Thank, thank you. you, Peter. <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Um, it is really my pleasure and honor to have uh, Yinka Shonabari and uh, Belinda Holden with us today here at the ranch. Yinka was born uh, in London and moved to Lagos, Nigeria at age of three. He returned to the UK to study fine arts uh, at Bayam Shaw School of Art in London and then at Goldsmiths College he received his MFA, his Masters of Fine Arts. In 2002, um, Shonabari was commissioned by Okwe Enwazor, the eminent uh, curator, uh, to create one of his most recognized uh, installations, Gallantry and Criminal Conversation for Documenta 11. Um, I believe we'll see an image of that in a little bit. In 2004, he was nominated for the Turner Prize and was awarded the decoration of the member of the most excellent order of the British Empire, MBE. In 2019, Shonabari was made commander of the same order, CBE, which is now a formal part of his professional name. In 2008, his mid-career survey commenced at the Museum of Contemporary Art Sydney and toured the Brooklyn Museum uh, in New York the Museum of African Art at the Smithsonian uh, Institute in Washington, D.C. as well. Um, in 2010, his first public art commission, Nelson's Ship in a Bottle, was displayed at the Fourth Plinth in Trafalgar Square, London. In 2013, he was elected a Royal Academician in London. And in 20, um, I'm sorry, and uh, in 20, if I'm getting this date wrong, sorry, 2017, uh, Wind Sculpture 6 was featured in the courtyard of the Royal Academy of Arts as part of their summer exhibition. Um, finally, his work is included in many of the most notable museum collections, including Tate uh, London, the National Museum of African Art, Smithsonian Institute in Washington, DC, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, the Guggenheim in New York, um, uh, Moderna Museet in Stockholm, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, and many, many others. I, I will stop there. Um, Yinka is represented by uh, James Cohen Gallery in New York and Stephen Friedman Gallery in London. We're lucky and thrilled to have both of them here today with us uh, as well. Belinda Holden is the Managing Director of Yinka Shonabari Foundation and the Guest Artist Space Foundation in Nigeria. Um, she leads the governance, fundraising, and strategic planning. Previously, she was the co-founder of an arts consulting, developing, and delivering cultural strategies uh, and programs uh, institution, and as well as commissions in both the UK and Australia for the uh, Melbourne Metro Tunnel and Rail Project. Prior to that, she was head of the Sydney, Australia uh, version of uh, Future City, a UK-based arts, culture, and built environment consultancy which develops strategic partnerships, managing a core team uh, with freelance projects, managers and curators, and, and being involved in the arts from a very strategic level. I welcome you both. I'm really thrilled you're both here. And I want to turn it over to Yinka to tell us a little bit about your work. Well, first of all, um, I just want to thank you for, um, for, the, for the honor of inviting me. Uh, you know, much appreciated. And also, to say that the opportunity has also given me um, a way to actually to stop and think about what I do, and and so I've, I've you know 
had to kind of think about it. You know, how do I sum up what I do? And I think um, that there are actually two aspects of this. So there is the, why do we want to be artists? You know, why, why do I want to be an artist? And so that the, there's the issue of the, there's the utopian aspect of it. Um, that of trying to make the world, you know, a little bit better. And looking at my own, the history of my own work and how that actually evolved. And, and I take that from the, let, let's say from the civil rights um, movement. And so the idea of actually being inclusive so that we have, we try to have a diverse society that kind of, you know, includes everyone. Now, when I left art school, um, which was around about my first degree, 1989, something like that, um, internationalism then meant mainly Euro-American art. Um, you know, many diverse artists were not really properly included in that conversation. But within academia, within colleges, um, of course, that was when the development of, um, you know, post-colonial writing, uh, you know, people like Edward Said, Gayatri Spivak, um, so, um, the, so, and then, you know, post-structuralism, post-modernism. Now, all of those terms, they might sound a bit theoretical, but really what those ac um, academics were seeking to do, and also many feminist artists, they were seeking to look at the whole of history, the, the canon, culture generally, and writing the history of other people, the history of women, the history of Africans into that um, global history. Now that's the context in which I started to come out as an artist, started to work as an artist. Um, now there is the social dimension of work. So by that, I actually mean, as artists, we are doing things that members of the public recognize. So, so I'm, I'm talking about the um, the connection between life and art. So my work then, because I was trained as an academic painter, because so I went to a very kind of conventional um, you know, college. And so the work then became kind of you know, political. I wanted to bring the world into my, into my, into my work. So I went to, um, then of course I was making work about what was going on in Russia at the time, you know, uh, perestroika. Um, one of my uh, tutors said to me, well, you're, you're of African origin, aren't you? Why aren't you producing authentic, authentic African art? And I thought, well, what does authentic African art look like? What might that look like? So then I went to uh, a market in London, Brixton Market, and they sell the batik fabrics I now use in my work there. So I started the converse, conversation with them about those fabrics. You know, where, you know, where do the fabrics come from? And then I was informed that the fabrics are Indonesian-inspired fabrics produced by the Dutch and then sold into the um, African market. And I thought that was very interesting because that was very inauthentic in the sense of the kind of global connections. Um, but then the fabrics then became a metaphor, if you like. And so that's how I started to use the, the fabrics. Um, but the reason I started to talk about the social dimension of my work is to connect studio practice, what I do in my studio, with the other kinds of things I do outside of, outside of the studio. And so I'll, I'll take you through some of my works very quickly, and then we will then talk about the work I do outside of the studio, um, which, you know, many artists have done works 
that are socially connected in some way. I mean, in the 90s, that was the whole idea of relational aesthetics. Um, and the, the, the idea of relational aesthetics was actually coined by um, a French um, curator critic called Nicolas Birod, and he came up with this notion, this idea. That's when artists are actually being socially engaged. So it's not necessarily about pre presenting objects. It's about your relationship to your community or how you make things happen as a community. So, all right, so um, the first work um, here is a, is a piece called, uh, I think it's called Double Dutch. And um, so this is when I, you know, took, I've been trained as a, uh, as a painter, but then I stopped painting on canvas, so I decided to paint on the fabrics. And so that's the first uh, presentation, which was then uh, the first piece of uh, artwork I sold, by the way. And so, and my first sales was to um, Charles Saatchi. <laughs> now, it's, it's significant mentioning Charles Saatchi because in London at that time, a lot of my, a lot of my contemporaries, so were people like um, Damien Hurst, Tracy Emin, and so there was a little exhibition, which and that exhibition, I believe, came to America as well, a, a little thing known as Sensation. Mm -hmm. And I think, I believe sensation actually caused a sensation. Um, anyway, so I had a, um, I had a work in, in, in sensation as well. And so kind of just giving you the history of um, the work. And then, um, then the work, of course, because of my own background, um, you know, I was, I was born in London but grew up in Nigeria, and Nigeria has a colonial relationship with Britain. And so I started to kind of, you know, poke fun at British history. So transforming the, um, you know, British colonial dress uh, into my art. And so, and this is a painting by Gainsborough um, that I've kind of parodied here. And the painting can be seen at the National Gallery in London. Um, that's uh, Mr. So the painting is called uh, Mr. and Mrs. Andrews. And this is called Mr. and Mrs. Andrews Without Their Heads. So um, I was quite radical when I was younger, so I decided to, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I, I don't chop people's heads off anymore. Um, I'm a bit more conservative. Uh, so anyway, so um, then bringing the work back to uh, what I talked about earlier, the idea of social engagement, I'm going outside of the studio. So I started then to, this is my first series of uh, public art. So on the London Underground, I had um, posters of this. Um, I dressed up as a dandy, and I did a series called Diary of a Victorian Dandy. So of over 40 stations in London. I had these huge posters. Because uh, when you're young, you know, you think you could do anything. So, um, you know, I probably wouldn't have, I probably wouldn't be brave enough to do that now. I don't know. So can we go to the next one? And um, so that's that series. Okay. And yeah, so this um, is based on Fragonard's uh, The Swing. And um, so the, I was then nominated for the Turner Prize. And so this is one of the pieces I, I um, installed at the Tate. And it, the piece is now in the tech collection. Um, okay, can go through. And then, so, back to what I was saying about inclusion and diversity. Um, so the curator, Okwi Nweso, was um, invited to do documenta. And so he brought, he really broadened the scope of how you would define um, art or contemporary art. So I had, I had this piece in documenta. But at the same time, just before Oakley's documenta, there was a show that was really defining in including um, the works of diverse artists. It was a, a very controversial exhibition at the time, but a defining exhibition called uh, Magicia de la Terre. 
uh, magicians of the earth. And a lot of artists in that exhibition, many artists were uh, included who were not sort of, some artists were self-taught, some artists were kind of you know, non-Western uh, artists, but it was uh, an extremely uh, controversial exhibition. But then it, it really raised the debate about what, what, what then would constitute um, you know, international, uh, international art. And so Documenta really also helped to kind of um, um, deal, you know, create conversations around those issues. And, um, and then the work that's up there is um, a piece called Scramble for Africa. Now, African countries were mostly kind of divided amongst, you know, the European countries divided the continent of Africa up, up into different countries. And so that meeting took place, it was the Berlin Conference um, in the 19th century, and Africans were not necessarily asked if they wanted to, their, their countries to be divided up in that way. So this is me sort of reimagining all this kind of, you know, headless men sitting around the table and making a decision for Africans. Um, you know, so can we go to the next one? And you can see the continent of Africa there. Yeah. So, um, and then I think at this point, I'd like a drink of water, please. <laughs> I'll tell you when I have it. Yeah. Okay. You can leave it there. Okay, so um, the um, so then my I decided to kind of broaden the scope of my of my work, of my practice. Now this takes us to the point of residencies, which I want to say more about. Um, of course, you have an artist residency here, and residencies can have um, you know. A, a huge impact on the career of an artist and, and the possibilities as well. So I was invited to do a residency in Stockholm. And um, when I was in Sweden, I hadn't actually, I'd never made a film, or, um, but I, I discovered the story of um, Gustav III, who was assassinated at the ball. And uh, I believe Verdi uh, made an opera around this. And um, so I then thought it would be fascinating to recreate that ball. And so I did a, a film called uh, Umbalo in Mascara. And so, and can we go, so this is the, uh, the person who kind of assassinated the, um, the king. But can we, so that's just stills from, from the film. Okay, and then back in London, I collaborated with the Royal Opera House um, in London. And so I did a short film called um, Odile and Odette, which is kind of based on Swan Lake. And it's a black ballerina dancing opposite a, a white ballerina. And they synchronize each other perfectly. Um, okay, so the next one. Okay, so public art. Um, so this is my first public art. And I was invited to um, do the fourth plinth project in Trafalgar Square in London. Um, and this is called Nelson's Ship in a Bottle. And you know, Nelson won the Battle of Trafalgar against Napoleon. And that's why uh, Trafalgar Square is called Trafalgar Square. And if Nelson had lost that battle, we probably would be having this conversation in French. <laughs> 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 so, so um, and if you want to see this work, it's outside the Maritime Museum in Greenwich, National Maritime Museum in London. Okay, so, 
So after doing that uh, project, I got really fascinated by um, the idea of sails and wind and travel and migration. And so I then decided to start working with the idea of the, the invisible sculpture. So I wanted to actually sculpt wind, but of course I can't do that, but through the fabric I can you know, do the impression of wind. And the interesting thing about this sculpture is that it's uh, a hard material uh, made to look soft. Uh, so, and I like the kind of dynamism and the movement there. Okay, so can we go to the next? Okay. And I have these in different parts of the world. Okay, the next one. And so this is in uh, Central Park in New York, a public art fund project. And And then um, this is a work called the British Library that was um, now been acquired by the Tate. Uh, it's more than 6,000 books with the names of um, immigrants who made a huge contribution to uh, British life on the spines of the books. And also, um, there's a website and there's a computer where people write this, their own immigration stories about their families, where they came from. and um, and that's kind of active. Um, okay, go to the next one. Okay, um, and then we'll go to the next one. Okay, and the next one. Okay, so the, in those classical works, I started repainting the, because obviously the classical sculptures were not white when they were or originally made. And so I decided to put the color back into them. So that was a, that was a kind of a fun project to do. And this is the, uh, uh, another thing I do like is um, uh, opera. So this is the uh, magic flute, the bird catcher from the magic, from the magic flute. And I did this uh, project for the Mozart Festival in Salzburg. And so the birds are kind of escaping their cages there. Okay. And then I'm kind of, before you start getting too bored, I'm nearing the end. <laughs> so, um, okay, so um, I did a project about Picasso's collection of African art. And um, so can we, let's go. Okay, so, uh, so kind of putting the color back into those, but uh, my patterns. And then some quills, so that's actually not painted. Uh, they're stitched fabrics. So I've been uh, working on some quilts that I'm sort of developing. Okay, next one. And then another thing I will talk about a bit later, or Belinda will talk about that. I'm a bit obsessed with agriculture at the moment, so, and that's a sculpture I made, because um, we, have a farm, the foundation has a farm. Um, okay, so can we go to the next one? Okay, so at this point, um, so going on to talk, talk a bit more about the work of the foundation and how that started. Um, so this is my studio in London, and um, it's just by the canal. Um, I started to, I wanted to actually give opportunities to younger artists. And so I opened up my space. Um, I, there's a gallery in my studio. And then artists would have the space for a month. And they could do anything they could, you know, it was, I wanted to create a platform for artists to, to fail and experiment. And so they could, um, you know, either show work or actually make work there. And so I did that project for about 11 years. And that was very successful. Many artists did shows. Some of them got picked up by galleries, some of them. And, and they could do anything. It could be dance, it could be performance. But then I decided to properly formalize that and create a foundation. And so with the foundation, we now have a, a residency program 
in Lagos, Nigeria. And the idea is to create cultural exchange and to bring people to, uh, you know, artists from all over the world who've never really been to Africa and they want a platform to uh, be able to visit and work and be supported while they're there. And so here is where um, Belinda comes in. And ov over to you, Belinda is my yeah. foundation um, director. I wonder, you wanted yeah. to talk about the work? Well, I, um, I just wanted to make a segue. For, okay, for uh, yeah, no, that's fine, we can do that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> just a segue into this, because um, Inca, it's so clear, going back even to the beginnings of your work, you talked about the batik fabric and just the, the sort of um, network of exchange and power and commerce and um, that is, was involved with that and the surprise that you've expressed learning the origins of this, this, this fabric that's thought of as this authentic African expression which is actually this completely hybrid identity. Um, and that's been sort of the crucial part of your work um, and really the core from what we've seen and what you've talked about over the years. Um, but I, I, I wanted to talk about that and then that network um, because your foundation is part of another kind of network which is countering these networks in a way. Um, but the, um, you've described your practice as an artist as a Trojan horse practice. And when I mention that your professional name includes the uh, uh, CBE, yeah. I, want, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about sort of the impetus for that, how you conceive of this idea of the Trojan horse um, in terms of your practice being within institutions, having been between both places, between the United Kingdom and Nigeria throughout your life? Well, I think the, the interesting thing about what you've said is that I realized one thing, that um, when I started out as, as an artist, that somehow, if you are a black artist, you were expected to be angry. But I realized that I wasn't angry at all. I was very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and so that's a kind of a kind of a funny point, but but it's kind of true. And it's interesting because um, the stereotype says, you know, historically, you've always been exploited, so you should then present yourself as a passive victim of this exploitation. And so th the reason I actually break boundaries and I refuse the stereotypes is to actually show that, you know, as Barbara Kruger said, I won't play nature to your culture. And that's the basis of my strategy. Yeah. Now that's brilliant. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, the idea of the way in which you, and also, by the way, I find so much wit and humor in the work, I, I couldn't see it. Even the headless figures, I would never see as angry in a way. Um, but I think um, what's then interesting about what you've been doing a bit in London and what you guys, I'd like to hear Belinda talk about um, what the vision is for what you're thinking of doing outside of Lagos. Um, because when you talk about relational aesthetics, it's already imbricated in the work you've talked about and your interdisciplinarity and how you've embraced that over the years. And this seems to be as much a part of the practice, the, the, the foundation you're thinking about and, and that you've started. Um, and how do you see that as also being kind of uh, disrupting those networks and, and, and making new networks, as we could say, um, globally? What, what, what do you mean? What, what, with, with artists and producing uh, a, a dialogue um, with artists. Maybe you could tell us, Belinda, about what you are thinking for them, what you guys have been thinking about for the foundation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, it's on. Um, so, um, Yinka started uh, the Yinka Shonibari Foundation uh, in 2019. Um, I joined in 2020 great year and uh, to get a lot of projects off the ground and we uh, also started Guest Artist Space Foundation which is a registered charity in Nigeria so we have the registered charities Yinka Shonibari Foundation in London in the UK 
and then our sister organization, which is Guest Artist Space, which delivers our residences and projects in Africa. Can you hear me okay? Yes. No. Yeah. no. Shall I say it again? That's is that better? Okay. So the Inca Shonibari Foundation is a registered charity in the UK and it's under um, strict scrutiny and um, governance. And we've also set up Guest Artist Space Foundation in Nigeria, which is our sister organization, which delivers on the ground for us in Nigeria. So both organizations set up in 2019, and we really got going in 2020. Um, and during that time, um, we got going with our buildings. Um, Yinka has... Um, created these incredible building spaces. Let me show you. Oh gosh, it's not connected, is it? So this is, this is our space in Lagos, um, designed by British Ghanaian architect, Elsie Owusu. And this is, actually you should talk about this, because this was really your vision in terms of the space. Yeah, so this is, um, a, it's a kind of modernist uh, building, but it's also looking at traditional, so the tribe I come from is the Yoruba tribe, and they have, uh, the old houses they built have these kind of courtyards, and um, because so that the community can sort of, um, you know, be around the central space. So, and I thought for this building, even though it's going to be like a modernist building, it rains a lot in Nigeria, so it, it needs to be a kind of, you know, it's tropical, it needs to be a resilient building. And of course, there are various kind of environmental concerns as well. So, you know, we have to do it with uh, solar panels and, but so, but the building has a performance courtyard and then a small gallery and then three bedrooms for, um, for artists uh, as well. And then the artists have a you know living room as well to to, to me, so um, and that's where the building was kind of still uh, being uh, constructed, uh, not entirely finished. Okay. So we're on we're on our way. Can you hear me? We're on our way to being. So I can't hand, can't juggle everything. It's just crazy. Okay, so we officially opened our Lagos space in February this year. Um, as Yinka said, we've got a few things left to do with, with construction, but actually we're there. So we've got this incredible ground floor space, which is really a, a, a room not so dissimilar to this in one sense. It is a very flexible, multi-use space. We've used it as an exhibition space. We've used it as a lecture theater. We use it um, for our artists to perform, research, experiment. Um, we're looking, our, our residents are very interdisciplinary. So um, not just the, the, the fine arts, but architecture, the design, fashion, textiles, um, poetry, poets, curators, archivists. Um, and then in the farm, something else entirely, but I'll talk about that in a minute. So we've just welcomed our first three residents. Um, they were a curator from Zavi Contemporary in Berlin. And our first two fellowship, West African fellowships that we awarded, one was a filmmaker and one was a photographer, uh, sculptor. Um, and they've, they've had a, a, just an amazing experience. And here they are presenting after their, after their residencies to the wider community, the arts community in, in Lagos. And I think what's underpinning all of this is building of cultural infrastructure. So, and that, that is a question of building from the ground up. So it's really important for us to have a really interesting mix of artists or researchers or residents, whether they're from the Pan-African, across the continent, whether they're from the wider African diaspora, or whether they're from other places around the world. What's really important is that they come and live and work and research together. And in that sharing of a meal, 
in that sharing of ideas. That's where we get to know one, one another. We break down barriers. We break down barriers of prejudice. Um, and we start to think anew and think afresh. And I, that ultimately, at its very essence, I think that that's what it's about. And that living, working, and coming together and sharing of ideas. So it really is a space to fail, play, create new work. And then, of course, the um, residency is in two parts. So we have a 54-acre farm where we're practicing agriculture. And um, we, again, another unique building. Uh, the architect is an architect, Nigerian architect called Papa Omotayo. And so he excavated uh, the soil on the site, created 40,000 bricks, and, to, and that's the building for the artists on the farm. The building is up on a, it's up on a hill, and so you look down into a forest of uh, palm trees. And you know, some artists like it calm, they don't want a lot of noise, and they can also be, you know, doing their art with a little, we've got some goats now on the farm. <laughs> and um, we've got some goats, we've got chickens. And, um, and it's only, uh, just over two hours out of the, the capital. So the artists have a choice, actually, to uh, move between the two, uh, the two spaces. And we're, we want to do projects in um, you know, environmental research and agriculture. So there might be researchers that we want to collaborate with. Um, access to the site is quite difficult, so I've had to build a three-kilometer road uh, to get access to it. Um, so, but you know, with, um, I'm a very, nobody uh, in Nigeria thought that I could do a project like this there. Uh, but I'm very stubborn. Yeah. And the road, the road is still not great, but you know, I will persevere until I get these things done. Um, you know, so, that's, um, so do you want to continue? So that's a view of the farm. So there's, a, there's actually 10 greenhouses now. Yeah, we, ha we have 10 polytunnels now. And we grow tomatoes and pineapples and cassava, uh, peppers, plantains, uh, maize. Yeah, so... Um, fish. Uh, oh, yeah, we have five fish ponds, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, so anyway, we, we, we have a lot of exciting things going on there. So here's an image of... Some of our produce. Yeah. And it, and it means, what it means is about, it's about sustainable agriculture. So it's about full cycle agriculture. It's making sure that actually there is very little waste. Any waste goes into feeding the soil. So we got... 200 chickens that get moved around the farm, feeding the soil, and the goats do some of that work as well. And so do the fish. So we smoke the fish on site, but we also plant um, trees and maintain sort of um, rainforest areas, but also have a sort of, if you like, a tree plantation, so that we're creating our own charcoal to smoke the fish, the charcoal waste and the fish waste, feeds the soil, so again, so it's a circular economy. But it's also employing over 11 um, men from the village. It's also employing the women who are involved in the harvest, who are involved in um, pounding yam and um, selling to the markets. So it's also very much about food security. And it's about building that local knowledge. So it's a, it's a working model farm. And it's about education, it's about demonstrating successful small farming practice, and then m moving that learning out into the wider community. Yes, and also it's, cru it's crucial to understand why, why the farm, and to actually understand, because that's why I started my talk, by talking about the importance of social practice, um, so that the art, 
is now going out to do something practical on the ground. And also, because the, the nature of um, our environment at the moment and the concerns we all have about the environment, which is actually creating very difficult uh, food uh, crisis, actually, in many parts of the world. And so, as artists, do we want to just come and have a holiday or just, uh, you know, in that context? Or do we want to really be a part of the change? Do we want to contribute locally so that we're, we're actually, we're there, but we're useful being there. We're not, you know, but we're not, we're not sort of bring, imposing something on the locals because the locals do the farming and the locals manage the farms. Um, they do it all themselves. You know, so all we're doing is just basically providing the, uh, op, you know, the resources required for the local people to then do all those things by themselves. And um, so that's why the, and then many creatives now are also very concerned about the environment and they want to do, uh, they, they want to do projects, they want to do projects in nature and so we can provide that uh, enough space for artists to be able to do that too. Yeah. So some of some of that we're planning for now. So we're involved with um, the World Weather Network with Art Angel. Louder. So we're actually doing some of that now, and we're working with artists across the world on a World Weather Network program with Art Angel and 29 other organizations across the world. And we are actually um, having Rax Media Collective uh, hosting them at the farm um, to be our weather reporters. They're a collective from India, right? Yes, from India. Yeah. From Mumbai, yeah. Um, and, and you know, we've got architects, we've got designers who are coming to explore material technologies at the farm. We've got agriculturalists coming in agronomists, agronomists, which obviously is the exploration of food, uh, soil, and um, so it's it's very diverse and very interesting, and exciting. I think it's amazing how this has evolved out of your practice into you know expanding, and also when you take the word multidisciplinary and expand it to the point of scientists and researchers and all the different kinds of visual artists and things that are coming through. It's an incredible synergy of, of what's happening. And then to be involved with all these other groups through the, the World Weather Network and other things it sounds great. So what is the, the, what's the five-year plan so from, from today moving forward? What's happening uh, in your minds? Make lots of friends. <laughs> <laughs> That's the five-year plan. That's the five-year plan. <laughs> it's grow, grow, growing the, um, the studio complex on the yeah. farm. Um, we've got, we're about to start building a ceramics workshop, a textile workshop. The women in the village, local village um, weave, so it's important that we sort of build on that. And it's the relationship with partners such as um, fashion designers, textile artists, ceramicists, and organizations such as Anderson Ranch who are providing such an incredible resource for artists um, from across the world to come and, and live and work. And it's those sort of interdisciplinary, perhaps, exchanges. Um, and we work with galleries and universities. And it's those partnerships that allow that continuing exchange and that exciting opportunities for, for each other. Fantastic. I'd like it to open it up to questions from the audience. If anyone has a question, we have I think two microphones going around. There's one up front here. I have um, a few questions. One, I want to understand what you meant by Trojan horse, because I didn't understand that. OK. Well, there's a Trojan horse is a kind of, it's from Greek mythology, right? Yeah. And because uh, I should have paid more attention in school. But anyway, <laughs> but basically, it's when you go in disguised, right, under a different guy. So it's almost like camouflage. So 
And I think what happened was um, in the battle, there was a, you know, a kind of deception, and they went in as this Trojan horse. But they, they didn't realize that was the enemy. So it's like where the enemy disguise, when you disguise yourself as the enemy into something else. So people think you're something else. You just, it's, so it's kind of like camouflage, really. Like getting in, it's about getting inside. Yeah, so you get inside right? under different guys. Yeah. yeah. Under, yeah. And how that applies to your practice? Well, so rather than feeling, rather than um, wanting to present myself as the opposite of the establishment, then I'm immediately othered. I become the other is to actually present myself as the same, making me less scary, right? But it doesn't take the radical out of it. It's just um, a kind of chameleon-like thing so that I can do what, I, what I've got to do. Thank you so much for that explanation. The other question I have has to do, it says that you had three residencies going on right now in Lagos. Um, how many people are living on the farm? Are those residencies too? And how um, do people apply to those residencies? Okay, you can take that. So um, we've got three live work spaces in Lagos, as we, as we said. And we've also got three live work spaces currently on the farm. So it's, it's absolute rainy season at the moment. We can't really access is very difficult to the farm. As Yinka said, the road just kind of starts to disappear. We have to rebuild it again each each season. Um, pretty much like kind of when it probably snows and destroys the roads up here. Um, so at the moment we've got we haven't got any residents at the farm. Our first residents arrive in September, and they'll be up to so we can have up to six at any one time, three in each location, and they can swap. They can move. Between, between the two, two spaces. We restrict our open calls. So you asked, you know, how do you apply? Um, we kind of, we're, you know, we're, we're a small organization. So a lot of the time we work with our friends. As Yinka said, we're here to make friends. So we work with partners, um, whether they be institutions, education institutions, museums, galleries, um, other like-minded organizations, um, and we will either run a small, very specific call linked to that organization, or that organization will nominate, um, or we'll invite people with our, in consultation with our advisory panel. So we're quite flexible at the moment, because we're a startup. <laughs> but they mentioned the uh, fellowship call that you just did. So we just did our op an open call, which was for West African artists. So it was our West African fellowships. And we, um, we were originally going to give three fellowship awards. Um, and we had 160 applicants. And the level and the quality of work was just so incredible. We were just, the, the selection panel were just blown away. Um, so we decided uh, after sort of much debate that we would award seven. And we've managed to sort of squeeze six into sort of this year and, and one into, into next year. But, you know, it's, it's incredible. We're starting on this journey. We'd, we'd like to make the opportunities wider if we can. Um, but we need to talk about sponsors and donors and, and helping us, you know. Yinka has provided the infrastructure, but my job is really to now sort of raise the funding to run the programs and also to run education programs in, in Nigeria as well. So learning in a public program is just as much a vital part of what we do as well as the residences. So we're hoping that we'll get that off the ground as, as we move into, into the next coming months. Is there another question? Okay. Um, at what point in your career did you decide to, I guess, not I I incorporate a practical element instead of um, theoretical or purely artistic? Um, 
No, that, yeah, thank you. That's a good, good question. You know, I've never really separated those things. I've never really separated theory from practice. Um, you know, even when I was in class and I was being, you know, absorbing all this stuff, I always saw what I was absorbing contextually. I, I always felt that there, there is a, you know, there, there is always a social dimension to this, you know, to this stuff that, that you, you, we all kind of talk about and write about. So I've always, ha I've always made a link. So in that sense, I've never really been, um, I've never really been a pure academic in that way. You know, I've always seen, I've always joined the dots between all these things. Yeah. You could, uh, thanks so much uh, for coming and joining us here at Anderson Ranch. Just a, a quick question about your early practice. The sculptures were all headless, uh, and also the race was neutral, it appeared in the works. Yeah. Uh, and I assume there's an intentionality in all of that, and it would be just interesting to know kind of, you, you evolve from headless sculptures to sculptures that have globes uh, as heads, and maybe just a little bit about kind of why you chose to present your sculptures as headless and also race neutral. Yes, so um, it's a series of uh, complexities. For example, I was studying um, semiotics, which is basically the study of signs, right? So, and by that is what you represent something with, right? Um, so um, there's that Magritte, famous Magritte painting. It's a painting of a pipe, but underneath it says, this is not a pipe. Now what that means is that the painting of the pipe represents a pipe, but the painting of a pipe is not a pipe. So the painting of the, the, the image of the pipe is only a pipe in painting because we, we've all agreed that it is a pipe. I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> So, but it, the painting is not intrinsically a pipe. Um, so that then, the things that we use to represent ourselves, so if I said in the kind of, within our culture, if I say you're a white man, that means something within our culture. Now, if I say, you know, I'm a black man, that also carries historical baggage within our culture, right? So then you, can, then you can mistreat somebody based on those cultural assumptions, based on the cultural baggage. Now, what semiotics helped me to do to, was to help me see the gap between the signifier and the signified. So the signifier, the image of the pipe, and this, the signified, pipeness. So I don't know if that makes any sense at all, if I'm kind of making any. So in answer to your question, um, not having the color and having the neutral color is to actually move beyond categorizations. So then I don't fall victim to the baggage of history. I don't know if any of this is clear. I'm just talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. Is there another question? <clears throat> Gosh. Why, Jim, why? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the globe is kind of universal, you know, like a kind of a global, not geographically specific, you know, to include everybody. It's actually that simple. <laughs> yeah. I think you just answered my question uh, because <laughs> I was wondering, because the non-colored and also the whole African, British, and the fabric of Indonesia made, and the Dutch, you know, it, is the purpose part of it, and, and the amazing colors, 
to bring the world together and like, you know, to, the Trojan horse is almost a sneaky way, but it almost seems like it's a way to pull it all together. Would you say that or am I talking nonsense? <laughs> oh, no, you're not. <laughs> no, no, I've got a monopoly on nonsense. <laughs> um, yes, yes, no, I mean, obviously, it's trying to be truly, I mean, sometimes I think my practice can be a bit utopian in the sense that it's actually trying to be truly inclusive. You know, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. And I think that's really what the, in the end, my residency program is about to, to actually create a platform. Because the traffic historically, is, it's always been one way. You know, it's people from the south going to the north. Well, can we find a way to bring people from the north to the south and actually get educated and informed rather than being entrenched in, in this kind of uh, northern sphere of things? And so we're trying to see if we can find a way to do that. Yeah. And how many different countries are you reaching out to in terms of bringing residents? so far, or I know you're, I'm sure you have a vision of the world, but where are you so far and what's the kind of? So, so far we've got um, residents coming from most of Northern Europe. So we've got France, Germany, Italy, Sweden, um, and then we are, we have New York, Chicago, um, Cuba, um, Ghana, South Africa, um, there's a couple of others. <laughs> um, then we've got Mumbai, India, and we're also talking to some Asian um, artists as well. So it, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's a range. It's a global range, yes. It, but it's making sure it's across the global yes. south as and well as, as global north. north. Yeah. Yeah. And then the other aspect I'm very keen on is to uh, find ways to support African-American African artists uh, to have the opportunity to come to, to uh, residences in Africa as well. That, you know, and also, um, you know, the um, Afro-Caribbean um, yeah. artists, to, to, so the diaspora, the African diaspora. Uh, to also have a, a platform for them. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Is there another question? Outside. Oh, outside. Sorry. Thank you. I was curious if you considered your residency program and the foundation part of your artistic practice and then how they inform each other. So does your work with the foundation inform your practice and vice versa? Yeah. No, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, I see it as part of my practice as an artist. Um, and I see that, of course, you know, I have to go through the, the proper vehicles of the foundation to actually make it possible. Um, so the, the foundation is a vehicle that will create the possibility, but inevitably, uh, it is a continuation of, of the practice. There's one question over here. What is the average age of the students that you have in the fellowships? The average age of the students? Or of the residents? The residents in the fellowship. Oh, the they're younger. Right. Are completely varied. Um, so it's not really, it's. Um, it's not age related. It's not it? age related. No. Uh, I think, in terms of practice and where researchers or artists or, or residents are in their practice, they are certainly beyond the emerging stage. So I would say they're, they're, they're building up to possibly mid-career and, and up. I think that's quite important because it's also about bringing that sort of expertise and knowledge to Nigeria and to West Africa. Um, but in terms of our local fellowships and our, our local artists, 
Um, it's a real mixture, with, but we also support more emerging creatives within yeah. that within that structure. Well, my my own kind of vision is that we will actually take the age thing out completely, yeah. and um, you know there are artists who are you know seventy years old, but they're, they're emerging artists, you know, or there might be artists. It's also very important that artists who are well established can do a residency like this because they can bring experience. Uh, you know, people can learn from them, and also emerging artists can have the opportunity to develop their uh, work alongside other established. So I think you you actually get a much better residency if you have all different levels, because that's when the true exchange can actually happen. I think we're going to wrap it up. I want to thank our guests for being here. And thank you all for being here, too. Thanks. You guys, thank you.